Hello, I'm Andy Stevenson and welcome to another episode of A Winning Mindset, Lessons from the Paralympics, brought to you by the International Paralympic Committee and their long-standing partner, Alliance. Together, our aim is that these podcasts can help you in your own personal and professional life. You'll be introduced to people who can inspire and change the way you think with their stories of facing life's challenges, often helped by having the right team behind them. There may be some episodes you haven't got round to yet, so please do subscribe to this podcast and take a listen to the likes of powerlifter Sharif Osman, canoeist Peter Powkiss, and badminton player Daniel Chan. Today's episode is with Hawaiian-American Kaleo Kanahela McClay, who, as you will hear, has a small child, a small business, and a not-so-small appetite for more Paralympic glory with the US sitting volleyball team. If you're out there now juggling several things at once, hopefully Kaleo can offer some words of wisdom. Kaleo, I, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. It's, it's a wonderful name and Hawaiian in origin, is that right? Yes, and you pronounced it great. That was awesome. <laughs> do, do any of your names mean anything in, in Hawaiian? Yeah, so my full name is Kaleo Okolani Kanahele and it means the voice of the heavens. Oh, wow, that's, that's quite a title. Yeah. <laughs> bit of pressure on you to carry that title around with you for your whole life. <laughs> I know. Everyone thinks I can sing. I'm like, I can definitely not sing. So don't ask. <laughs> it's nice for us to be able to say we've had the voice of the heavens on the podcast series. So that's uh, that's good. That's a good start. <laughs> now, um, it's becoming a bit of a theme to talk about baking on this podcast because uh-huh. we had sit skier, Winter Paralympian Ali Velazquez on a couple of weeks ago talking about the bakery empire that he started in Mexico City of all places and now you who run your own cookie business so it's uh, Cookies by Kaleo how how did that start? Yeah so I have Cookies by Kaleo and then my husband our business partner and I just opened Flower and Flower so that's more of a shop front but I started Cookies by Kaleo after Rio Um, I was just wanting something creative to do I was kind of at a point where I was a little sad that the games were over. We had just like won the gold medal, like the most awesome time in my life. And then it was just all of a sudden nothing. I've heard it be called the post Paralympic blues. And that's actually something that like I can very much relate to because that's where I found myself. It was such a high, I was working towards nothing but winning that gold medal for years. And then we conquered that goal, which was a huge accomplishment. And I'm so grateful for, and that was Um, everything I've ever wanted. My personality is definitely an achiever and I like to have a goal that I'm working towards. I like there to be something um, on the other side that I want to reach and I want to do. And I always want more, which is sometimes good and sometimes very bad. It doesn't always go in my favor. But (laughs) um, when I um, started Cookies by Kaleo, I always knew that I wanted to have a shop front. That was like the next the next goal. Sometimes it can cause me not to appreciate where I am. Um, so I've tried to do a lot of work of, although I'm looking towards these future goals, I want to appreciate where I am at the time because sometimes I can forget or look past, be looking so far in front of me that I don't actually see what, what I'm living in and, um, the dream that I'm actually living in. So, uh, yeah, it's been something that I've been working on. I think that's something we're all probably a bit guilty of, aren't we? That the world just seems to go at 100 miles an hour and we don't actually stop and reflect on the things we've done well and uh, and our successes. Now, um, as you say, you, you know, you've got a couple of businesses on the go. You're a Paralympian, you're a, a, a mother. We're going to talk about all of that in, in the podcast and, and we'll certainly talk about your, your Paralympic glory in a moment. But first of all, let's go back to the start. Can you tell us a little bit about your disability? Yeah, so I was born with clubfoot. Um, my it actually runs in my family and the Hawaiian side of me. Um, some of my cousins have it as well. So really, like my main disability and limitations are um, jumping, flexion. Um, my foot doesn't move left or right. It, I have a little bit of movement up and down, but so that's on my left leg. It's hard to picture, but if you picture a golf club, that's pretty much what my foot looked like. Um, it was actually turned in and I'm missing one of the bones that help support and um, keep it straight. At eight months, I had my surgery. It has a long name that I can't pronounce. Um, and 
And so reconstructive surgery and basically I'm limited with um, mobility and I lack a calf muscle. So I, in my sport um, and classified, they just changed classifications, but I classify as a minimal. And can you remember the first time you felt that you were different because of your disability? I guess in family circles, as you say, you had relatives who had the same condition, but perhaps more around your friends and at school. Can you remember when you first felt a little bit different to the others? So my mom um, really raised me not to necessarily know. So I didn't actually know that I was born with clubfoot or had any sort of a disability until I started doing sports and were around other kids um, athletically. So I actually did ballet and um, in ballet, they had a skip. And can I tell you, that was the most frustrating thing I think I've ever tried to do. (laughs) Um, Because since I don't have the flexion or the mobility or the calf muscle, um, jumping off my left leg is pretty non-existent. Um, And that was really, I even remember it and how frustrating it was. I didn't necessarily know why, but I just thought it was so frustrating that I could not do it like the other kids. And so then my mom had, my mom and I had conversations about it. And and after that point, there were times that it would come up quite a bit, but I never really wanted to live myself or live my life limiting myself or thinking of all the things that I couldn't do. So, um, I really did push myself in even in standing volleyball, cause I played standing volleyball as well. Um, I, went to different trainers who taught me how to jump differently, or I worked with coaches to do what I could in a different way. One of the times being in basketball, I couldn't do um, a left-handed layup because you, or sorry, a right-handed layup because you jump off your left foot. Um, So one of my coaches used to yell at me because I couldn't do it because he didn't know that I was born with clubfoot. Um, And so my mom didn't tell him until after that, that I had a disability um, because she didn't want him to treat me any differently. And I know that your mum instilled some really strong values uh, into you. How much of an influence was she? Oh my gosh, my mom. She's incredible. She um, was a volleyball and a basketball player and she, one, loves to be athletic. So that was always one of her number one goals is to get us into sports. And, and I'm so thankful for it. That woman, she like we would get out of school at three and she would drive all the way through the night and we would get to somewhere like Minnesota at like 8 a.m. and show up in a gym and um, just all the sacrifices she made so that I could do what I loved and and be able to push myself and get to the Paralympic level even is um, she's incredible. So with those sacrifices in mind that especially your mum made, how important did sport become in your life and did your disability ever get in the way? I just loved being athletic. I loved pushing myself and seeing what I could do. There were times that um, my disability would come up more than others. So in standing volleyball, it came up a lot because jumping is a big thing, um, a big part of standing volleyball. But I always tried to feel as included as possible. So I never really wanted others to know until it came up, especially coaches. Um, Later in life where it was more undeniable, I've had more difficulties with coaches, but in the Paralympics, it's been such a a great place to be. Honestly, I've even struggled with not feeling disabled enough to be in the Paralympics at some point, which is so funny. And I talked to my team about it too, because I am in this middle ground of, I, my disability comes up a lot in standing, but in sitting, I feel not disabled enough. So I have kind of felt in this middle um, and with classification, sometimes it makes it feel that way too. Yes. And just to explain for those not familiar, classification is the system of making sure there's a level playing field of people with similar disabilities playing a given sport. And with sitting volleyball, you're either classified as disabled or minimally disabled. So I can absolutely understand that you're looking around and seeing your teammates or your opponents on the other side of the net who might actually be missing limbs or their wheelchair users. And I can see why you might think, should I be here? But, but of course you should. Yeah. And, um, that was something that I kind of kept to myself with the team for a few years. Cause I started really young. Um, and then whenever I started to find my voice, I, I communicated with my team of how I felt and how classification and, and being a minimal made me feel, especially within the team. Um, and they are great people and 
my closest friends, but um, they basically just reassured me. They're like, you deserve a place here. You have been through just as much as the rest of us. And um, basically they just continue to tell me my value on the team and how thankful they are that I'm on the team with them and that I am, I have a disability and that's undeniable. But there's always that brilliant moment when you're at a sitting volleyball match and they bring out the um, trolley type thing you might get in an airport and the players tend to take off their prosthetic limbs and put them all in the trolley and then it's wheeled off. That's right, isn't it? Yes, yeah. For a spectator, that's kind of... I remember looking around at London 2012, people who'd clearly not seen sitting volleyball before and there was a, there was a slight moment of, oh, I don't know how to react to that. I'm not quite sure whether to be shocked or smile about it or, or just accept that it's part of the sport but it, it was certainly something that raised a few eyebrows I grew up around sitting volleyball and um prosthetics and all of those things and um but it's it's still funny whenever people aren't um because I remember my friend one of my te- teammates at London like she was in the London games um but she was missing her arm and so she had a prosthetic on her arm and it was like one of our jokes that we would walk and she would take her arm off and I would carry her arm like I was holding her hand and we would just walk like that. It's really <laughs> silly, but people would be so confused. We did that in the mall once and people were beside themselves. They had no idea what was going on. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's funny cause I'm so used to it and used to being around prosthetics yeah. and everyone taking off their prosthetics and, but not everyone is. I just want to ask you one more question about your school days because one of the other athletes we've had on this series is, is Tatiana McFadden, a US Paralympic legend. And, and part of her story is, is the campaign that she and her mum in particular fought for equal opportunities for school children with disabilities in terms of being able to compete in sport and not be discriminated against. She's incredible. And I'm very thankful that I haven't had one of those experiences. Um, we fought a lot, my mom and I, for um, basically within the sport of volleyball for me to be accepted and my disability because of my limitations, um, not being passed over for the number one teams or the A teams um, within club volleyball. But she's, Tatiana is incredible. And I'm so thankful for, for people who do push one for equality. And, um, cause one of our teammates, Katie Holloway, she, um, has pushed a lot for equality with, um, our pay compared to the Olympics. And it's, I'm so thankful, you know, it's people like, like her and like Katie who, um, really have allowed us to, to be where we are. And, and I'm so thankful for that. Yes. And as you say, we've seen concrete evidence of that unity and desire for equality in the USA with the American Olympic and Paralympic committees, things like equal pay, equal rewards for medals across the two games. And that doesn't happen everywhere by any means. Now, we mentioned the 2012 Paralympics earlier and watching the sitting volleyball in London. At those games, you and your USA teammates won silver, losing to China in the final. How did you deal with the disappointment of missing out on gold? We got silver and that was an extreme disappointment. And I remember going off the court um, and crying to my teammates. There's a picture of me and Laura, like me crying in in Laura's arms and me crying in Kendra's arms because it was so um, such a huge disappointment for our team, I think. But in reality, it's you won a bunch of games and then you lost one game and all of those wins got you the silver. You didn't lose to get the silver. You, you won a bunch to get the silver. Um, but as an athlete, it's like you want the gold and that's all you can think about. But even looking back now, I'm thankful for the silver then. And I'm thankful for what it did in me. And it ignited this commitment that I, I decided, one, I never wanted to feel that way again. I hate disappointment. I don't like losing. Um, and then also I realized that I do have a place on the court. And the particularly sweet thing about Rio 2016, four years later, was that it was China again that you, you met in the final and this time you beat them. And it's gone long. There are your gold medalists. United States at last have victory over China. What an incredible match. Bill Hamilton with the fist pump and quite rightly. He come out with a game plan for his team and they have delivered brilliantly. 
what what was different about the way you approached that match? Why did you win on that occasion and not in 2012? I think our team had developed a lot, um, especially going off of London. Um, some of those, like some of the London players retired and um, which opened up a new avenue for, for newer players and different players. But we did a lot of work in the four years leading up to Rio um, on team dynamic um, and playing cohesively as a team. Um, we also did a lot of work in learning systems because we'd always played really to beat China. And um, we realized that that's not actually our goal. Our goal is to be the best versions of ourselves. We've been talking a bit about family. And uh, in October 2017, you got a new perspective on family because you and your husband, Matthew, welcomed the arrival of your baby son, Duke. Now, was juggling motherhood and sport and I guess even business as well, something you thought about before Duke came along? No. So the, <laughs> like two of the things that I never really thought about, especially growing up, were one, getting married and two, um, having kids. I just, it wasn't necessarily in the forefront of my mind, um, like some of my friends, but it was just funny that in my early 20s, the first two things that I did were got married and had a baby. Um, <laughs> so it was really never, I mean, even Duke, he... Um, surprised Matthew and I um, at such a perfect time. But but yeah, so I had really never thought about it before it was happening. So Duke's just over three years old. Has he got a um, a volleyball to play with on the floor? Is he, is, he, is he getting involved in volleyball at all yet? Yes, he, so he can actually set. I feel as if some people would be skeptical to say that, but he can. And it's pretty impressive. Um, a setter is, um, you receive a ball over your head and you set it out to a hitter. So it's basically, you're kind of like the quarterback. So, so Duke is already having a little go at setting. Yes. And it's so cute when I leave them in the morning for practice. Um, he said, mommy, good volleyball. He calls it volleyball, like (laughs) B-A-L-L-B-A-L-L. Mommy goes to volleyball. It's so cute. (laughs) And did you ever consider having to choose Duke over the other things you were involved in? Did you ever consider maybe I'm going to have to give up the the sitting volleyball or I'm going to have to give up my business goals? You know, I think it's always a thought in the back of my mind because um, my first priority is my family. And in the past, for me, that's gotten clouded a lot. Um, I had gotten so good at compartmentalizing. So my, my family is here in my brain on the right side and volleyball's on the left side and business is in the middle. But in reality, they all work together. Um, and I've, I got really good at compartmentalizing. So honestly, so I wouldn't have to sacrifice one of them, which wasn't the truth. And the truth is I'm sacrificing more by not allowing them all to be together. So I've done work within the past year of trying to make my life more cohesive and and bring my family into into volleyball and bring volleyball into my family and bring the businesses into both of them. And I I definitely have always wanted to bring Duke along and bring my family along um, because I do think that I can do both. I can do all three. I can I can be a mom. I can be a family person. I can. I can be a business owner and I can also be an athlete. Um, And I I don't think I have to choose. I don't think I have to choose one over the other. But it is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to try and make them all um, work together. And this is something that, you know, quite often I hear interviews with sports people. And it has to be said specifically sports women. And these questions are asked. And yet actually the, the same questions aren't asked when it's a sports man. I mean, just for the record, we did. <laughs> I did interview a uh, a Colombian Paralympic swimmer, Carlos Serrano, a few weeks ago, and we did put some of these questions to him about fatherhood because he had um, a young child. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you feel about that imbalance? Yeah, I think it's um, more common, obviously, for women to to be asked those questions and to be to be asked to sacrifice more. Um, because even within sport, like let's give this last year, for example, when the games got postponed, that also meant um, I had to push back having a baby another year because um, Matthew and I want another. 
And for me, because I'm a woman in sport, that means I have to wait. That means our family has to wait another year. But in in a male counterpart, um, he doesn't necessarily have to wait. He can he can continue his family, and it's it's not necessarily something that would that would keep them from sport. Uh, I read an interesting um, quote from you in an interview where you were talking about going off on a training camp, and you said. I want to make this time on the camp as quality as I can whilst I'm away from my son to really make it worth it because it's hard to leave him. Is there actually a sense that um, being away from Duke and, and Matthew, your husband, might actually be an extra motivation to to your sitting volleyball career? Absolutely. Um, last year we were living in Hawaii, so, so I was traveling um, even longer away from my family um, away from Matthew. Thankfully I was still able to take Duke with me. Um, cause my family lives in Oklahoma, but, um, I was having to be away for longer periods of time. Um, and, and for more off, like in more often. So even whenever we went to Peru, that tournament was one of the tournaments that I was extremely determined because it is, if I'm going to be away from my family, I want it to be worth something. I want, I want to be present. I want to get the most out of the tournament. I want to train as hard as I can because I am sacrificing a lot to, to be away from my family and to be away from Duke. There's no perfect answer for how to balance um, being gone for your kid's birthday while you're on a trip. There's no way, there's really no way to actually do it correctly if there's even a correct way. Um, but it is important to have someone who you can do it with. Well, you're obviously doing a tremendous job because we we have a little surprise for you here. We have have a little clip for you to listen to. Okay. Hey, Kaleo. Just want to say that I love you so much and I'm so thankful for the incredible mother that you are to Duke, the wonderful wife that you are to me. Like I was saying last night, um, I would never want to spend my life with anybody else but you. And I'm so thankful for the adventures and the craziness that we've been through over the past four and a half years and plus of being married. And I love you, I'm proud of you. You kick butt at everything that you do. I'll always be your number one fan. Love you. Aw, you're making me cry. (laughs) I didn't know that was a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's very nice. That's your husband, Matthew, there. And uh, what you can hear, you know, that's coming from the heart. That's a, he genuinely thinks you're doing brilliantly to, to combine all the various things that you do and and I guess it's it's vital that he and the rest of your family are there to support you as well yeah um because we travel so much Matthew has only gotten to see me play a handful of times but but when we lived in Hawaii he um had a very upfront role in training with me so he was really the person who was tossing all the balls he was getting more involved in learning about all the different aspects of volleyball more than he probably has ever wanted to know but I'm so thankful for him and he's obviously there as well on the sort of fatherhood side to you know we were just talking about equality it's in, it's important that both parents play their role isn't it yeah and honestly he has done it so well i i honestly could not do volleyball without him and i'm so thankful that i have him as my partner to be able to to do this with because when I'm gone Duke is with him when I'm training Duke is with him so I really couldn't do it without him are there any practical or sort of tangible tips or advice you can give to people listening who might be marveling at how you juggle all these different aspects how do you make it work to be a mom an athlete a business owner and a pastor all at the same time how, how do you kind of get through all that without just going crazy well, I think I go crazy sometimes, but um, <laughs> I something that I really have practiced is um, really being where I am while I'm there. And I, I know we talked about it earlier of how much of a struggle it can be. But, um, but if I'm um, in the parenting role, if I'm with Duke, my goal is to be there with Duke um, and making time for that. You know, you make time for what you care most about. Um, and when I'm working, when I'm working on developing the business or when I'm making cookies, I choose to be there. I choose to, to be focused on what I'm doing right then and there. Or if I'm at practice, you know, I'm not spending all of practice wondering about the business or, or what Duke's doing, but I'm really doing my best to be at practice. Um, and that's really my tangible way, obviously schedule. There are so many different, different ways to schedule and task manage and things like that. But, but I think the, 
the real core of all of it is being present where you are while you're there. Um, because you do, you only get 24 hours in a day. And if you spend 12 of those worrying about the next 12, then you're not going to be present for any of it. Um, so focusing on what I'm doing while I'm there and then really trying to just keep track on a schedule. I love that. Be where I am while I'm there. That's just superb. I'm going to try and use that my myself. And I think I might know what your answer is going to be to this question because of just hearing the kind of personality and character you are. But has your disability had any impact whatsoever on on how you mother? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think a lot of people can be determined by their their can'ts, what they can or can't do. But I, I really do believe you can put your mind to absolutely anything and accomplish it. So I think it's really helped me in parenting because I do know that Duke can accomplish whatever he would like. Right now, he currently wants to be a robot. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, you can be a robot. Let's figure it out. And, um, but I think as time goes on, I think it will, it'll show more in being a parent in that way. Uh, and what about the moment where you know, Duke might notice there's something different about you and you have to sit down and explain. I feel like because he has actually been in this, this Paralympic world for his entire life, um, I think he has gotten a good realization of the, the differences and how that makes us all, um, so unique and, and beautiful, honestly. Um, and even with Bethany, it's like Bethany is missing a limb and I'm not and the differences and even as a baby, he would like play on her leg and just having that conversation, I think will, will allow him more understanding of, of one life experience and how everyone experiences life differently. And as well as, I mean, just different things that people have to overcome in life. And, and honestly, his privilege of not um, necessarily having a disability or having to, to go through the surgeries that I had to go through or, or needing prosthetics like other people, but he can appreciate all the differences. I mean, actually, is there a case that you, you might not even have to have a, a sit-down conversation? Because as you say, he's surrounded by disability all the time and and when he gets to six seven eight years old and gets curious he'll he'll sort of have all the answers there in front of him anyway yeah i i do think it has been by um experience i think he's seen different disabilities he's been within this environment for so long i think it's almost normal to him to to see prosthetics everywhere like even in the gym it's like like you were saying of like the um, you called it a trolley, which I love that, but like the little <laughs> car. Um, oh, that- I should have, I, I was, you know what? I'm laughing because you know what? When I asked you that question and I was stumbling around for what word to use, and of course, yeah, cart would have been the, the better one, but I'm glad you like trolley. I'm glad yeah, I put you should a smile stick with trolley. I like that. <laughs> I might start calling it that. Um, but, but the, the limbs in the cart, I just think it is normal. And, and like even growing, me growing up, I joined this team at 12 it became what I'm used to. It's not anything abnormal. Um, it actually would shock me when people would treat it as abnormal. Um, like walking through airports, if people would stare too long, it would actually really infuriate me because this is what I've grown up around. These are the people I love. Um, don't make them feel, feel different or something to be stared at, if that makes sense. But, mm. but I think being around it really helps understand it. And this is the power of the Paralympics, isn't it? I mean, you're seeing you're seeing it up close, but you know, broadcasting the Paralympics around the world and getting as many, particularly young people, seeing disability on their TV screens and and computers. You know, it's a huge it's a huge purpose of the IPC to to get disability just far more visible around the world, and it's so important because then all children will grow up with the same. Um, experience or very similar experience to Duke, even if they don't have a disabled family member themselves? Yeah, I remember being in an airport. I think it was actually right after Rio. Um, And they had, it was almost a sculpture, but um, of a person, I'm trying to remember the sculpture, but basically it was um, someone with a disability. I think they might've had a prosthetic and there was a curiosity of this little girl and she went up to it and she was like, dad, what's that? 
And the dad was like, oh, don't worry about it. Just come here. And I was like, I'm just watching this interaction happen. I was like, wow, you missed a very teachable moment of being able to explain to your daughter what a disability looks like and, and how it can be normalized and, and just a, a teachable moment visually as she's curious. You know, I think a lot of us lose curiosity because we're sort of taught not to ask questions or, or not to um, want to know more, but kind of pretend like we know it all, you know? Mm-hmm. But I think as, as people see, as the Paralympics are televised, as people see the, the Paralympics, as people see Sydney volleyball, they are able to ask more questions. They're able to see and understand um, and not just determine outcasts or determine different, um, but really be able to see and accept and understand. Well, it's, it's, been, um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, Kaleo, and um, I will send you my address after this to, to send me some cookies because uh, it's, it's tea time here as, as I'm uh, recording this. So I'm feeling a bit bit peckish and you've just made me want to tr- to try and eat some sugar now in the next couple of hours but i will uh, absolutely <laughs> send you one which is not going to help my own athletic ability but <laughs> we will uh, <laughs> we'll gloss over that but it's been uh, fantastic speaking to you and thanks for sparing the time thanks for having me thank you again to kaleo for squeezing in a podcast interview amongst all of her other commitments We really appreciate it. And I learned a lot there, especially about staying in the moment and enjoying things as they happen to you. And the difference it makes when people with disabilities are included and seen rather than segregated and marginalised from an early age. If you enjoyed our conversation, then please do subscribe to this Winning Mindset podcast and learn from other Paralympians like Greg Polychronidis and Manuela Scher. Next week, the final episode of this series... And we go out with a bang. One of the standout stars of the Netflix documentary Rising Phoenix, Bebe Vio. Do not miss that one. Hold up. 